always a pleasure to be here with you hello everyone welcome to the african people podcast this podcast is about africa regarding the political side the historical side the cultural side and so many more each week i deliver my best thought and analysis regarding africa here your host amaduba today i have a special guest here join me to welcome my guest my first guest is andre lapierre he's the executive director of the global open data initiative for agriculture and nutrition Thank you so much sir, for joining me this weekend on African Podcast TV. My pleasure. My second guest is uh, Dr. Richard Munenga. He's the coordinator of the United Nations Environment Program. Thank you so much sir, for joining me this week on African Podcast TV. Thank you for having me, Amadio. Pleasure. Thank, thank you. Dr. Richard, the first question will be you. I'm going to ask you the first question. How do you see agriculture and food system in Africa, and what is the situation right now, in your opinion? Yeah, thank you very much, Amadou, for that question. I mean, the reality is that when you look at the African continent today, we have um, 257 million citizens going to bed hungry. And out of that 257 million citizens, each and every year, the deaths, especially of uh, young, of children, 50% of those deaths are as a result of malnutrition. And when you put the elephant in the room, which is climate change, which is already redefining the contours of the continent. This only adds to the difficulty that we see ourselves in, because as we're speaking, the reality is that every climate prediction shows that staples in which the African continent depends on, whether we're talking maize and other staples, are going to actually be impacted and reduced by up to about 40% if the world was to reach two degrees. So when you look at the climate manifestations, manifested through droughts, through floods from East Africa to uh, the Sahel. The reality is that the food systems in Africa are broken. And that broken food system has actually been made worse now by the COVID-19 health emergency or pandemic that have actually not only curtailed access to food, but at the same time plunge the bigger chunk of the continent, which is the informal sector that constitute over 80% of the population in terms of um, creating employment, COVID-19 has actually made their life uh, very difficult. So the reality is that if you, you look at the food systems and put the climate change aspect within the equation, you put the youth on employment, which is 60% of the population, of the youthful population, 60% of that very population is unemployed. When you put all this together, it becomes realistic that Africa's food systems broken with all these other stressors, something needs to be done. Okay. Um, Mr. Andrew, would you like to add something on that? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Amadou. Uh, I agree uh, totally. Just mentioned that the point. One, uh, agriculture is the driving force of the economy in Africa, so it's very important beyond the, the human aspect of it, of course. Um, there, are, there are three main things affecting uh, agriculture right now, I would say. The first one is global warming. Dr. Richard just mentioned it. Indeed, as the world is becoming warmer, it's becoming more and more difficult to, uh, to grow certain types of cultures, maize being, of course, one of the, the most critical ones. An indirect consequence also of global warming has to do with water. Water is becoming very much a problem. We, we talk about a nutrition crisis emerging, but even before we reach the peak of that nutrition crisis, we may reach a peak of a water crisis, which of course is very much needed for agriculture. Just to illustrate the point, we're saying that before 2050, 
between 2000 and 2050, the world would have to make available, some say produce, but I'd say make available 50% more food than we used to produce before. Having in mind that in a number of countries, most of the fresh water available already goes to agriculture, in some countries up to 90%. So it's, it's mathematically difficult to see unless we change the way we do things, how we're gonna be able to produce this additional 50%. Second thing that is uh, difficult for agriculture uh, has to do with, uh, is an indirect consequence of uh, climate change, and it has to do with extreme weather events. Uh, in the 1950s, about 5% of the Earth's was affected by extreme weather events defined as uh, tornadoes, uh, droughts, uh, fires, uh, extreme weather events, as, as the name says. Uh, now, it's about 25%, so five times more. So, and the pace uh, is increasing faster and faster as we go. So um, that leads to um, uh, epidemics, infestations, uh, locusts, uh, uh, just major losses of, of crops, uh, which is a major problem. And the third one is more directly linked to the COVID-19. With the COVID-19, one of the, uh, uh, the public health measures that all the countries in the world, in fact, have taken was to try to limit the mobility of people to prevent the spread of the virus. But in limiting mobility of people, uh, while not really aiming at that, we also limited the mobility of goods, including food and fresh produce in particular. So I, I can think of a number of countries where uh, for a while you had curfews implemented, you had a lot of uh, road checks uh, and sometimes border closing altogether. So as a consequence of which, um, fresh produce, which are very much uh, time dependent, they need to reach their market uh, before it deteriorates. Um, oftentimes were no more able to reach their, their destination because by the time it would arrive there, after all the curfews and the checks and whatever, uh, they, they would just be in no more in a condition to be consumed. So the combination of these three, I, I think, was a major factor, is continues to be a major factor affecting okay. agriculture in Africa. Okay, let's talk about uh, malnutrition and hunger now. Dr. Richard, and uh, how African can end uh, hunger and malnutrition and how it can build a future-free hunger and malnutrition in Africa. What do you think about that, sir? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, a lot, Amadou. Um, I think um, when you look at hunger and malnutrition, it is not an issue that can be addressed as a standalone. Uh, it has a lot of precursors, a lot of causes elsewhere that cascade to drive malnutrition, to drive hunger, to drive food insecurity, because the reality is that the solutions to hunger, the solutions to malnutrition, the solutions to food security are not necessarily going to come from the Ministry of Agriculture or to come from agriculture itself. It's going to come from what I call enablers, because let's look at it from this perspective. If you look at Andrea mentioned, the issue of food loss, which is costing the continent 48 billion US dollars each and every year as a result of inefficiency in the entire agro value chain. And with COVID-19, actually only helping to exacerbate that because of closure of roads, because of curfews, because of lockdowns, that number has only increased. And that means that the food losses are actually a bigger equation to food insecurity, a bigger equation to hunger. And the other aspect is food safety. As we're speaking today, the entire African continent is actually losing 16.7 billion US dollars as a result of unsafe food. And each and every year, 130,000 Africans die because of unsafe food. And that then means because of the ways in which food is preserved, the ways in which food is dried, if you go across the continent, if you take vegetables, they are drying in open sun. If you take cassava, it's drying on open sun and other food stuff that is being contaminated. To address that issue, we need clean energy solutions. That's not coming from agriculture, but it's coming from the energy dimension. We, we need simple, accessible tools like solar dryers that have actually been proven to reduce post-harvest losses 48 times faster as compared to open sun drying. It's actually been proven to reduce aflatoxin that comes as a result of uh, food being exposed 
and as a result of food being contaminated, it's actually been proven to reduce aflatoxin by up to about 53%. That has actually been linked to liver cancer. So what is the point? The point is to address hunger, to address food insecurity, to address food safety issues, the solutions are actually not necessarily going to come from agriculture, but they are going to come from other sectors, especially clean energy, solar dryers that can be decentralized to communities to be able to reduce this. And and we talked about water. The ecosystems are quite very instrumental. Whether we're talking about forests, whether we're talking about better management of a soil. And practical evidence has proven that ecosystems-based adaptation, that's nature-based approaches, for example, like agroforestry, for example, like application of organic manure by fertilizers, can actually increase crop yields by up to about 128% and actually ensure nutritious food. But what we are also seeing from climate change is that climate change can actually is going to reduce zinc, which constitute up to 60% of the staples that people depend on by about 9%. And that will further exacerbate malnutrition. So the point is, it's not a one size fit all to beat hunger, to beat malnutrition, to beat food insecurity. It's a holistic approach that brings integrated approaches, but leverage on enablers that can actually be able to be accessible in local communities like solar dryers, but at the same time also ensure that they create opportunities for the young people. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Before, before you add something on that, uh, Mr. Andre, do you think Africa should adopt and implement long-term nutrition action plan and how? Uh, Yes, indeed. I, I think it's it's very necessary, and I, I would like to expand a little bit on what you just mentioned. Now, um, malnutrition is very important, and uh, that that's one of the the things that triggered the creation of the SDGs or the MDGs. Now, the SDGs, and under the uh, the MDGs, the Mid Decade Goals, the world as a whole was very happy, so to speak, because malnutrition overall had had reduced quite drastically. Could say uh, from uh, let's say roughly 950 million people being uh, malnourished to around 800 million, a little bit more than 800. However, in the last year or so, because of the disruptions happening uh, due to the COVID-19, also to climate change and other factors we mentioned, uh, the number has been shooting back right up. And unless we take action uh, very fast and, and very soon, it's very likely that within the next uh, few months, uh, all the gains, that, that's the risk, that all the gains we made in combating the decreasing hunger under the MDGs could be wiped out. So it's very important to take action now. Uh, okay, and on this note, there's a number of things that, that can and should be done, but uh, one thing that's important is to make the difference. There are two types of malnutrition, so to speak. The one that we normally think about is when people go to bed hungry. So, but there, you, there are people that don't go to bed hungry, but that are equally malnourished because of a number of things. COVID-19 was certainly one of them because of the disruptions in food systems in general, the cost of food, especially nutritious food, uh, perishables, veggies, uh, and so on, uh, has gone up uh, worldwide. So it makes it less affordable for people. So the tendency uh, is to go for cheaper food, which is not necessarily as nourishing. So that means the quality of the nutrition that people ingest is less. And this has been exacerbated because of the COVID-19. Second is the point Richard mentioned, rightfully so. Climate change also has a negative impact on the nutritive value of what we grow. So you might not feel hungry, but you're getting less and less nutrients. So these are two issues that need to be addressed right now. And there are many, many things that need to be done. Just to mention one of them that, that was referred to earlier has to do with testing. Uh, Richard just so referred to food security, which is very important because indeed aflatoxin is a, is a big concern. Uh, it's one of the major contaminants in the food that's ingested uh, in Africa. And that's something we need to, to find. But one of the problems is the, the lack of uh, rapid testing facilities. So it's mm -hmm. difficult to really monitor, control where exactly the contamination is happening and therefore to be able to take action to, to remedy to it. So investing in technology in testing is very important. And, and second, in having a, a comprehensive um, 
policy across the continent. Because as you move from one border to the next, you know, climate change, infestations, diseases, uh, no borders, they just move around. So that's why a comprehensive holistic approach on the continent is very important. Perfect. So let's talk about that, uh, Richard. And uh, we, I know that you have been in this industry for a long time and uh, we definitely understand how agriculture and nutrition, how, how they work in Africa. But the, most of the time, the government, some government have been working, but the short term, so what do you think about the long term? Do you think Africa should implement something like for the long term in agriculture or in for, for, for malnutrition? Yeah, I think I think um, uh, uh, that's a very good question. And I think I'll build on what um, uh, and Andrea said. It, the reality is this. If you look across the continent of Africa, nearly every country have um, a food policy or have a climate mal agricultural policy. And um, even from the highest level in the continent, the Africa Union Agenda 2063 actually have food security as a very uh, top priority. And there's even the, the years in which uh, uh, they actually attack the year of food security and nutrition. So in, in terms of the agenda, in terms of the policy, those policies can be revised so that at least they can be given precedent. But the biggest issue with the policies are implementation, implementation, implementation. The implementation of some of the policies have not happened at the speed in which they are supposed to happen. But one thing with the policies in the continent that can actually ensure that th th there is a long-term approach to addressing food insecurity as well as malnutrition is what I call policy innovations. Because the reality, as I indicated earlier, and I think Michelle has also touched on that, is food security policy alone will not be able to address food insecurity issue and malnutrition. It needs to have enabler. So we need what is called policy harmonization, where agricultural policy is reconciled with energy policy to decentralize solutions to communities where energy in terms of solar dryers, in terms of clean energy off-grid to ensure that solar powered refrigerators to help people in communities used to um, store perishable or solar dryers to dry the food are actually decentralized. We also need innovations in finance where finance actually can be made affordable to assess these inputs of organic fertilizers or inputs like solar dryers or coal refrigerators powered by solar. So we also need transportation to be reconciled to where the food is produced so that at least where food is produced, where agricultural actions are taking place, routes are actually constructed so that farm to market is enabled. So policy harmonization and policy innovations need to happen. But when it comes to implementation, one of the biggest challenge that we see in the continent today is we have the youthful population, mm -hmm. which is 60% of the entire African population is youthful. And that number is increasing. So you're talking over 400 million citizens in the continent who are youthful, and 60% of that very number is unemployed. Many mm -hmm. of them are disenfranchised. Many of them are leaving the continent in search of greener pastures. So the point is, in addressing malnutrition and food security, that also presents an opportunity. Yes, it's a challenge, but it presents an opportunity because the solutions are actually areas in which young people can create jobs, jobs can be created for young people. So developing incentives that can actually result in young people being trained, retooling their skills to devise, to turn waste, for example, to buy fertilizer, which becomes an input to power agricultural production, to turn local resources or materials into solar dryers. That becomes an opportunity that will be creating jobs for the youth, but all these will be resulting to helping address the food insecurity and the malnutrition issues in the continent in terms of quality of food, in terms of how the food is dried, in terms of how access to markets is also happening. Like Andre mentioned, technology, which is very, very important. The young people are tech savvy. They're developing applications, technological mobile applications that are linking farmers to markets. How can we be able to tap into that and incentivize many young people to do that? So a holistic approach is needed to be able to address these challenges, but it also presents an opportunity to create jobs for the young people in the course of doing so. Okay, that, that's really interesting because I think that, and I believe that agriculture can create more jobs in Africa, but 
like you said, some 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 youth, especially the young generation, my generation, some people, they're not really, really interested in agriculture because they think agriculture is not a really professional job. They're just thinking about having working in the offices. And in my opinion, agriculture is really, really something really interesting. If you look at it in the United States of America here, the people who have really big money, has money, they, they have uh, they have they have they work in the farmers, they have agriculture going on in the in the other hand, but they do have money, but they have been working in agriculture. It's something really interesting. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about crane jobs, let's talk about the and uh Mr. Andre, do you think agriculture can, can create more jobs and help eliminate poverty and hunger in Africa and how? Oh, for sure. Uh, and we've been uh, so far talking about problems, but there are many avenues of solutions indeed. Um, but let me just try to, to summarize my thinking about that. One, a friend of mine some uh, years ago made a big statement one day. He said, hunger really is not a natural problem. It's a policy problem. Uh, and I'll give you a couple examples uh, for, for that. In Africa, the agricultural potential we have the potential in Africa of producing about three times the food that we're producing now, if we just change the way we do things, three times. Now, the simplistic way to, to look at it is, uh, then you will immediately have people say, oh yeah, but that means cutting down all the trees and removing forests. Well, it doesn't, because the about two thirds, um, almost three fourths actually of the potential increase in, in productivity does not arise from expanding the land. It expands from uh, increasing yields within the land that's already used in agriculture. How do we do that? Well, there's a couple of ways. One, we we know that in Africa, uh, on average, uh, Africa uses about one fifth of the uh, the volume of fertilizers than the rest of the world uses for similar surfaces. One fifth, and one of the reasons for that is the cost, uh, the cost of fertilizer to burn in places because it. Um, the, on average, according to just a recent study that, a study that was done, on average, the, the cost of fertilizers, that a bag of urea, for instance, that people may buy in Kenya or some, some other place in Africa, mm -hmm. about half the cost arises from costs that, that happened after importation in the country. Oh. So if it was and, and other little charges that add up, the cost of fertilizers would be half what it is now. So that's certainly one thing that our politicians, our leaders should look at. The second is technology. We just mentioned that. Uh, I'd just like to uh, underline uh, mobile phones in particular, and especially smartphones. Mm -hmm. Smartphones, uh, people don't realize, but they're extremely powerful instruments. They, they're used nowadays in agriculture for many different things, using uh, image recognition to identify infestations, pests, for example, and many other things. But just to put things in perspective, a typical smartphone today has more computing power than the computer that drove the Saturn V rocket to the moon. So, you know, so, and many times more, more powerful. So there's a lot of power there. Uh, power, as I say, to use applications to bring knowledge in, in a format, in a language, in a manner that farmers can understand. So to help them uh, better perform in their agricultural activity. However, we need to uh, promote that some more because um, uh, smartphones uh, are, are a powerful incentive for companies to invest in technology in strengthening their network, gradually moving toward G, for example. And as they're improving the capacity of their network to transport all of this data, uh, the, the whole infrastructure benefits from that. Jobs, now you were mentioning that. Uh, no, sorry, just to conclude on, on the mobile phones. Right now, all in all of Africa, all of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in all the phones that people use, and there are many, only 39% are smartphones. So that means two thirds roughly uh, are, are technology, which are limited in terms of their capacity to provide these tools for the farmers. So investments need to be done there. Coming back to policies again, because maybe if taxes were less import uh, duties and, and others on these smartphones, their costs would go down, then more people would have it. What impact does that have on jobs? Not just the smartphones, but the use of the phone as an instrument to bring knowledge and to empower people. I'll just quote one example. When Kenya opened up um, the use of mobile banking, using using phones, even old, old technology phones, um, one group that especially benefited from that were women. In the first couple of years after mobile banking was implemented in Kenya, we estimate that over 185,000 
jobs were created, benefited women uh, into trade and, and doing business and doing other things and being more able to control their own budget and therefore play uh, a more active role in the economy. So you see th this uh, policy uh, impact on investments in technology in the end of the day trickles down all, all the way to the farmer, even in the last mile. So that's really where we should focus our attention to. Something really interesting. Let's talk about women. Something really in interesting in Africa, because if you think about it, the women represent 70% of the workforce in agriculture. If you think that's really interesting, they have been working in agriculture for a long time and then they have been working. But the policies, the most of the policies doesn't, doesn't, doesn't help them. So how do you see women in agriculture and food system in Africa? What do you think about and do you think the government should change the policies to affect more women? Sure. Oh, great. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you again, uh, uh, Amadou. Yeah, the, the reality is, as you rightly said, I mean, over 80% of the food we depend on is produced by smallholder farmers and, uh, and most of those are women. So that then means that the food engine to drive food security are actually women that drive uh, food security and at the same time, if they're empowered and um, incentivized, definitely a food secured Africa can be possible. But this is what needs to be done. The reality is that we need to also look at where do this bulk of these women fall? They fall within the informal sector. And within the informal sector, one of the biggest challenge that they face is inputs. But this input, sometimes it's either access to finance, that is access to affordable finance, access to inputs like clean energy solutions to dry their food like solar dryers, access to inputs like biofertilizers, access to these inputs like solar power refrigerators, but they do not have the finances. Mm -hmm. What needs to be looked at is how can we leverage structures that most of these women belong to that have actually existed within the African continent nearly in every community in every village and when you look at that it is not necessarily in the mainstream of discussion when we are discussing food security in the continent and that is cooperative community cooperatives they have different names across Africa in West Africa they call them Jangis in East Africa they call them Chamas but those cooperatives can actually be used and leveraged because most of them contribute their little money into those cooperatives. But if there were incentives, for example, like there are stimulus packages that are being fronted across the world and even in the African continent, if these cooperatives can be leveraged and those stimulus packages actually given to, through channel through these cooperatives, that could be an opportunity for some of these women to assess affordable finance. But that should be tacked with sustainable practices that are leveraged to grow. Across that's one aspect. The second aspect is that, as Andrea said, most of the women, they grow food. The problem is storage. The problem is value addition. They lost the food. They grow, they produce food. But three quarter or nearly all of that food is lost because most of what they produce sometimes is perishables and they cannot even last for over a day or two or three. That then means that inputs, like I mentioned, solar dryer, simple solutions can actually be made affordable to them. But that then means we need to empower young people. We need to help young people to retool their skills to start producing some of those solutions. And we are seeing that across the continent through what we call innovative volunteerism, where young people are guided and their skills are retooled to fabricate simple solar dryers and then decentralizing into community to help mothers and women in communities to dry their food. And this is helping put more income in more pockets and food on the table. So in summary, to empower women to drive the agricultural transformation, which they are already doing, it's not a one size fit all. It needs a system thinking approach where access to input, where leveraging on communal cooperatives, where they have access to and where they belong and where they understand becomes quite very, very instrumental. But we're also ensuring that some of the inputs that they lack can actually be provided through leveraging youth skills and talents to produce. That way, we will be making effort to drive transformational change, but at the same time, also creating opportunities for the youthful population in a sustainable environment pathway. 
Um, uh, Andrew, Andrew, do you think Africa can and how? And do you think access to healthcare is another critical factor in driving down malnutrition? Um, I think uh, access to knowledge is what's going to, in, in the long run, uh, what's going to bring down nutrition. Also, empowerment of the key players, women being number one in there, and o over a longer period, youth also as the future generation. As we know now, uh, while Africa is the uh, the youngest continent in the world, really, with around the 30s, so it's, it's the youngest, really, worldwide. But if you look at... Um, the average age of farmers uh, in in Kenya, for example, the average age of farmers is 59 years old. So other places, 60 or even more. So uh, the the future is really at stake there. So we need to find a way to attract the, the young generation to be there. And I think technology is certainly one of the ways to do that. I mentioned uh, uh, to, to bring the knowledge that in turn will help people um, perform better in their agricultural duties. Just to, to give an example, back back to this this famous tool, the the the, the, the phones, the mobile phones, and especially the smartphones. Uh, according to ITU in, in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, in theory, half of the the African populations uh, is is in reach of mobile phones uh, networks. So therefore, of the internet, less than a of that is making use of it because they either it's too expensive or it's it just doesn't work very well so there is certainly a need to invest on that in general but in particular let's uh, talk about women one of the issues with women is they uh, we need to help them be more empowered because in many because of cultural political legal technical other reasons uh, women don't have as much control over their economy or the economy of their their village their family, their, their community, as men do. Yeah. And there, there are many reasons for that, uh, so which I really would take too long to expand on that. But one, one thing I would say is, is that um, technology now exists to bring knowledge to women in their local language, even if they can't read. Uh, there are methods using pictograms, using voice messages uh, to, to bring them knowledge that will allow them to, to to, to perform better. And this is especially important because in sub-Saharan, in the world in general, the the digital divide, the, the access to, to technology between gender has been decreasing, except in sub-Saharan Africa where it has been increasing. In fact, it has been increasing quite drastically. According to ITU, um, if you're a man, you, you have twice the, 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 the opportunities to access and use technology than if you were a woman. Yet we know that most of the agricultural workers, producers and processors are women. Yeah. So if we want to increase agriculture productivity, we need to give the tools to those who do agriculture to perform better. So that's that's one of the, the, the keys to do that. Uh, later, we can also on losses because losses are very important. Women do have a role to play there as well because they oftentimes are responsible for the cooking, the preparation of the food, and, and indeed the, the, the preservation of the food as well. So while uh, an increase in infrastructure facilities, cooling facilities, better storage facilities will help, uh, knowledge there again plays an important role. But just to put things in perspective, in Africa, according to a recent study done by the World Bank, in Africa, the, the food losses represent uh, in sub-Saharan Africa a little less than 500 calories per person per day. Think about that, 500 calories per person per day. Thinking that uh, for an adult or normal adult person, we're looking at about 2,000 calories per day as, as the necessary amounts. So if 500 is wasted, that's already a big chunk. So um, focusing a bit on losses is, in my opinion, at least equally as important as focusing on improving productivity on existing yields. So, yeah. Okay. okay. Let's talk about, uh, in your in your opinion, what what Africa should do more to improve agriculture. In your opinion, you have been working in this field for a long time and you have experience on it. So, what do you think about that? Yeah, thanks again. I think the reality is that the continent is not starting from scratch. And I think, like I always say, if we do not appreciate progress, we can never make progress. I mean, there have been progress 
um, uh, since the Maputo Protocol, since the Malabo Protocol, there is progress that has been made. Is it enough? No. And, and, and why is it not enough? Because the silos approaches that are being leveraged are not actually adding that much and opportunities have been missed. The reality is that agriculture is the engine of development. And Africa cannot make meaningful transformation without leveraging agriculture as the engine of development. And that engine of development cannot be done by governments alone. Neither can it be done by private sector alone. It must be done also leveraging on the biggest known state actors constituency, the youthful population, because that is the sovereign asset and that is the sovereign capital. But they need to be made to know that the jobs that they that will be created will be created across the agro value chain because the agro value chain is worth one trillion US dollars in less than years from today. Those are the, 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 those are the figures that we have from the World Bank report. And the reality is also that all the jobs that can actually be created for the youth will come from that. But what needs to be done at the moment is to leverage and tap into these sovereign assets, as I mentioned, which are the youth, because the reality is that a skilled human being is 15 times more than natural capital and four times more than produced capital. What does that mean? If the youth are guided to retool their skills to fabricate inputs like solar dryers to help decentralize to communities, mm -hmm. modern villages will be able to dry their food. They'll be able then to ensure that their food can have a longer life shell, which they can sell when the prices are up, and at the same time ensure that they reduce post harvest losses. That will also create opportunities for the youth because the biggest empowerment is also economic empowerment mm -hmm. at all levels, whether it is the youth or whether it is women or whether it is every segment of community. When people are so economically empowered, they can afford services. Mm -hmm. They can afford services that can then be able to help them live a dignified life. So to be able to move forward, the entire agro value chain needs to be leveraged, but it needs to be leveraged also tapping into the sovereign capital that I mentioned with the youth but youth who are guided and motivated to retool their skills, who are guided and motivated to tap into opportunities in the agro value chain. And one of the easiest place for them to tap into is to tap into solutions in reversing the post harvest losses that are costing the continent over 48 billion US dollars. But leveraging on already existing enabling policies, like we're speaking today, actually solar energy is cheaper in Africa than anywhere in the world. Enabling policies that every country have actually captured in their Paris Agreement, what they call the NDCs, which have been ratified at every, nearly about 93 countries in the continent have ratified. So the enabling policies are there. Tapping into them needs a mindset change, especially for the young people, but at the same time also each and every one of us, regardless of what we do, to continuously inspiring and motivating the young people to see that the agro chain is actually the gold mine that they sit on. Let's talk that really important because the youth. Let's talk about the youth. In your in your knowledge or in your opinion, uh, Andre, how do we convince the youth in the agriculture and food system sector? And what do you suggest that the African government should do? Well, I think we need to do a combination of things, um, starting from the top with putting in place the right policies, the right financial incentives. We spoke of uh, fertilizers and technology before. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you see many people nowadays when they think of agriculture in Africa, they think that, you know, I don't want to be a farmer because being a farmer means I'm going to be poor. I'm going to be working, breaking my back my whole life and I will not have much. Yeah. We need to change that. We need to change that because that despite the, the this hardship when we ask people then why are you doing agriculture oftentimes they would say well that's that's what my family does that's our passion you know that's our blood so which is great but but now we're trying to change the mentality a little bit keeping the passion but looking at agriculture more in terms of a business so that people look at it more in in terms of actual facts cost uh, profits and loss and, and, and look at it a bit more as an enterprise, as small as it may be. 
uh, to have a more rational, a more data-driven agriculture than we've had before. So that's certainly uh, one, one thing to do. And technology will help very much. You know, we, we might, uh, some people might despair, they say, oh, well, you know, we need a $4 trillion investment in technology in Africa before we get anywhere. Well, I, I, I don't agree with that. We, we do need a lot of investments, it's true. Infrastructure, storage, uh, energy, and so on is very important. But um, uh, we, we need, um, what was I going to say? Um, to, to really motivate the youth, we need to make it attractive. And, and technology uh, allows for that. But what that mm -hmm. means, though, and I'll, I'll quote another statistic coming from uh, UNDP at, the, at this time. They were saying that out of all the jobs there is in agriculture, in the next 10 years or so, 70% of these jobs are at risk. 70%. So it doesn't mean that they will all disappear. But it means that, that as economies of scale come up and as farms grow bigger and as technology comes up, things become cheaper, but they employ less. So what that means is that we have to stimulate work for these, these people that will not have work to do in agriculture. It's going to become much more mechanized and much more technological than it was before. And the key to that and the key to development really, especially in Africa, is in the plus value added. Just exporting raw materials, is, it generates income, but uh, other countries make more money from that. They just buy the, the raw materials and they, they process it, generating a, a significant plus value. And in the end of the day, they're the ones making the money out of that. So in Africa, I think the processing of the food, the transformation, uh, marketing, the distribution is where the future lies. And there again, with the young generation, much more educated than, than the, the previous ones, there's a great potential for that. There's a, a, a whole new generation of entrepreneurs in, in Africa that are just ready. We, we see tons of startups left and right that need to be encouraged, stimulated. We need to help the youth uh, get together. We need to stimulate cooperatives, uh, groupings of people that can pool their resources to buy, lease, sell, uh, and, and become more efficient, more active players in the economy. I think that's really where the future of African agriculture lies. Oh, good. Dr. Richard, let's talk about uh, the challenges and, and the issues because that's really important and then how to overcome them. What are the challenges and the issues in the agriculture system in Africa and how to overcome them? Yeah, th thank you very much, um, Amadou. I think that we've, we've touched some of the challenges. The reality is um, one of the biggest challenge is that agriculture is seen as a social undertaking rather than as a business, as Andrea said. And because of that, that actually disenfranchises so many young people not to venture to tap into the opportunities that are presented uh, by the entire agro value chain. And I will still go back to what I said before. The reality is, if you look at the sectors that can be able to produce, to create the jobs that are needed, to employ the over 60% of the unemployed youth that exist in the continent, it's only the agro, the entire agro value chain that can be able to do that. Manufacturing will not be able to produce those jobs. S services sectors will not be able to produce those jobs like tourism. But there needs to be a different narrative that is attractive to be able to engage young people who can then see themselves as solution providers to solve the challenges that actually are visible to everyone in the entire global value chain. And one of the aspects that I would really like to focus and drill down on is the post harvest losses that the continent is losing. Because the reality is that, as Andrea said, if you are to increase production, because the continent produces, if you are losing 48 billion US dollars, that means that there is production. But if you are to increase the production without addressing the underlying causes of the losses that are already happening, then you will only have more losses. And that will just continue to drain resources, both environmental resources, financial resources, and even human resources. That way, it then means that, because not everybody can be able to afford a piece of land to produce, but everybody can be able to afford to turn their skills and retool them to produce a solution that can then be able to reduce the post harvest losses. So one of the biggest opportunity is that regardless of educational discipl on the, the disciplinary background, everybody can tap into the agro value chain, especially in the post harvest losses. 
whereby either they are retooling their skills to be trained to produce solar dryers or they're retooling their skills to be trained to actually start learning how to add value to what is produced. If you take cassava, for example, cassava is actually a climate resilient crop that is actually eaten by over 500 million people across the entire African continent. It can actually be produced, I mean, can actually be turned into 300 different products. It's, a, it's actually a non allergic crop. If we are to focus just in adding value to that, that could actually help you to not only to be able to be growing it, but actually to be turning it to cassava bread, to cassava cakes, to cassava. So there are a lot of opportunities that can actually be created within that particular crop. And that will create opportunities, businesses, and actually diversify incomes that will not only be able to ensure that youth themselves are creating their businesses, but to contribute to advancing food, a food secure Africa. Good. I agree. I agree very much with what Richard just said, and I would like to just add one more point. Uh, the losses I, I, I could not have said better. It's so important when you think that between thirty and forty percent of everything that's produced is being wasted or lost. It's a, it's a, it's an incredible loss. But back to the question of the youth in particular. You know, one of the things that um, makes uh, internationally that makes agriculture uh, very competitive. Uh, or is because of um, partially because of technology, economies of scale, also of course. But in uh, in more uh, economically developed countries, let's say, uh, farmers generally have access to technology that others in Africa may not always have. I'm thinking of things like precision agriculture, for example, which makes uh, extensive use of satellite uh, data, drone data, and so on, that allows farmers just fertilizer, for example, just where you need it instead of just distributing everywhere and wasting a lot. And similarly for agriculture, for irrigation and other inputs. So it reduces the cost of your inputs and makes your perform much better. However, uh, hundreds of millions of people in agriculture in Africa. So converting all of those to, uh, to this level of technology will not happen tomorrow. But what may happen though, is thanks to the young startups that, that I was mentioning earlier. That's where the young generation, I think, can have a, a very big impact. Uh, first, by being motivated to invest themselves directly in agriculture or indirectly, and that's my point, in providing services that others would benefit from. I myself, or with my organization, were very much involved in, in trying to encourage startups to provide services to farmers, uh, to cooperatives, to groups uh, of, of farmers of different kinds. So young startups that come up and uh, come up with satellite uh, services or drone services or other agricultural services that otherwise would not be available. So even if you're a small farmer for which uh, owning a drone or, or would be too expensive or using satellite uh, imagery would be too complicated, these startups will pre-digest this information for you and will just give you only the part that you need at a very low price. So I think this is certainly one area that's very interesting for the, for the, the young generation where they want to invest themselves. And that does have a significant impact on agriculture. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about the solution because we have been talking about the challenges, the issues, we have been making a lot of good points. But just my, my opinion, I think we have to talk about the solution. Can we, can, uh, please, can you tell us a few examples of solutions that you think the African government should put in place, Richard? Yeah, thank you very much. I think I think when it comes to solutions, I think we've, we've mentioned a couple of them, but the, the 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 reality is that there are a lot of solutions that are actually existing in in the continent. When you look across the continent, you will see youth funds that are geared towards agriculture. But as Andre said, the reality is that the, the the agriculture is still seen from the perspective of funding. It's not seen from this holistic approach of how inputs can actually be generated in a way that people can focus on those inputs as the top resources. And one of the solutions is not just to create youth funds or not just to um, have uh, budgets that take into consideration uh, the issues of agriculture, but to start looking how do you leverage communal cooperatives, as I mentioned, which every community do have across the continent to start channeling resources 
to this communal cooperative so that the informal sector, especially women, can tap to those resources to power themselves, to drive not only their production, but also get inputs to add value to that. If you take Uganda, for example, there is the Buganda Kingdom there, which they have a cooperative called Perosa. They are actually very grounded in the communal level through what they call village loans and saving associations. And through that, people are actually able to assess resources from the cooperative called Perosa to assess input. For example, simple solar dryers to dry their food. And we are working with them to help youth uh, develop those solar dryers and develop what is called solar drying centers. The women are drying their cassava and the cassava is being bought up and turned into cassava flour. What's the point here? The point is that accessible financing needs to move beyond big banks to institutions that are closer to people and also easily accessible by the people in these communities. That's one aspect. The other aspect is the aspect that Andrea has been mentioning, which is technology. And technology is very important. And technology sometimes is not a complicated technology. It's simple tools that can be accessible to people. If you take the youth, for example, if you take Kenya here, like um, Andrea mentioned, M-Pesa, which I believe they were actually the first across the continent to come up with mobile money called M-Pesa. And it was actually youth who were able to come up with that logic working uh, with Safaricom to do so. The idea here is not necessarily about the M-Pesa per se, is that the technology that can be tapped to do exist and youth motivated and inspired can create more technologies. But how those technologies actually reach a mother in the village becomes important. But those technologies today, they need incentives. The young people need incentives. If we just take a simple technology like rainwater harvesting, to what extent can incentives be given to the materials that are used to produce those tanks? And Andrea mentioned to these incentives so that the import, especially of the material that can be used to produce these tanks can actually be waived material to produce solar dryers that are imported car can incentives to wave off those taxes that are actually put on that be waived those are opportunities that can be tapped but in terms of solutions i mentioned solar dryers they are already happening in the continent young people are guided and their skills are retooled in terms of turning waste to bar fertilizers for input that is happening the issue now is to make this the norm not the exception. And to make that the norm, not the exception, policy is the biggest driver of change. The lessons that are coming out of these examples that young people are driving across the continent needs to inform policy recalibration, policy revision, so that at least this become actually integrated into policy to help power those small scale actions that are happening, those small scale actions happening through startups, that can actually be propelled not to become bigger and those solutions will be fell across the continent. If we miss that act, even though those actions are happening by young people, at some point, they will disappear. Without policy, meaningful change might not necessarily be sustained. Good. And I, I, please go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, no, I, I agree very much with what Richard has said. I will just expand uh, just for a second on um, this whole mobile banking issue. Uh, just, just for, because mobile banking is very important because it, it empowers people. It, it gives them some form of access to, to money, to the money market, to the formal market in, in some way, which normally would not be uh, available to them. There are, so, but the, 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 what I wanted to quote here is that there are in the, the entire world, there are 10 countries which, where the population has more virtual accounts, mobile bank, banking accounts, than physical accounts in the bank. 10 countries in the world, and all of them happen to be in sub-Saharan Africa. So I, I think it's a, it's a fantastic uh, thing. So there's an incredible potential there. And indeed, that is what we see. We said that beyond the uh, the exchange of money, the, the, the use that, that, that you do through mobile banking, this concept is being expanded in other areas. For example, in Burkina Faso, they have since a year, maybe a bit more, They've started to use mobile phones, not even smartphones, even the old phones using SMS technology. 
they use them to give farmers uh, direct access to the um, the fertilizer imports that the government does. Because in the past, the way it would go, the government every year would import large quantities of fertilizers, which would then be provided to a wholesale dealers, so to speak, and then distributors and so on. Uh, so a cascade of intermediaries. So by the time it reaches the uh, the farmer, well, many of them will not be served because they, they won't get any. And, and those that do, they might have to pay extra costs because of all the layers it, it, it reached before reaching them. So in Burkina Faso, we're using that, the government can communicate directly to the farmers, give them a code that they can use to directly withdraw their fertilizer. So it brings the cost down and expands access quite a bit. So you see that that's one example of, a, of of the way to the future to bring people into some kind of the full market, if you will, um, helping them to work together and giving them access to credit. Last point: working together is for cooperatives, but it's also back to policies and harmonizing policies. Because, for example, in pay if you're not if a different service provider you might not be i might not be able to send richer money because we have different providers so harmonizing policies developing a common standard would really boost uh, the, this uh, tool in, in the economy and in agriculture in particular which is a significant part of the economy in general so you see these are relatively modest investments that have a big impact so that that's really where we should uh, we should press forward Perfect. We are about to end this uh, interview, and uh, Dr. Richard, would you like to add something? Yes, um, uh, what I would like to add is uh, the, the the reality is that if you look at, we, there are, we have only 10 years um, to 2030. That means 10 years remaining to ensure that no one is left behind. Um, we have uh, countries that have ratified the Paris Climate Change Agreement, and in each of the nationally determined contributions in each of those plans that countries presented to build climate resilience there is agriculture sustainable agriculture and clean energy and when you look across all the 17 sustainable development goals there is no way the 17 you can be able to put poverty on the run and prosperity into the cockpit of progress without centering your development around agriculture because if you look at goal seven which is on clean energy Clean energy needs to be leveraged to add value. Add value to what? Add value to what is produced. That means agriculture becomes important. There's no way you can be able to lift people out of poverty without ensuring that you have a food secured country. That means agriculture becomes important. There is no way you can be able to create jobs, decent jobs, without actually tapping into the agro value chain. So my point is agriculture is the engine of development, not just to ensure a food secured population, but also to ensure a climate resilient population that is built around that leveraging on already existing enablers like clean energy solutions, because Africa after 165 days of sunshine, more so leveraging that clean energy to add value will be helping continent build climate resilience as they address youth unemployment, because that is where jobs can be created. And lastly, the aspect of traceability and accountability must be given importance. And you can only trace where actions are or ensure accountability when you leverage on already existing structures and actually formalize them. And the communal cooperatives becomes those centers where traceability and accountability can happen. So building on them and strengthening them, as Andrea have said, and empowering those communities and those communal cooperatives to become the centers to ensure accountability and traceability of actions to drive a food secured continent becomes crucial and that way we can achieve the sustainable development goals that will build climate resilience and ensure that the continent doesn't experience the fear of want on it perfect before i end this uh, interview would you like to add something andre well, I, I would just like to reiterate uh, my uh, optimism uh, because I, I, I think Africa is such a, an incredible continent, so full of potential. I think it's going to do wonders. The future of the world goes through Africa. There, there's no way around that. That's the way it is, and that's the way it's heading. Now, our challenge is that we're a little bit uh, in a race, one could say, 
because as much as uh, development is going fast in Africa and new initiatives are emerging everywhere, which is very encouraging, but the population growth is also very fast. So the idea is to increase technology and development faster than the population grows. Just think of Nigeria, for example, within this generation, we say that uh, the population in Nigeria is likely to almost double. So reaching around 400 million people just in Nigeria alone. So when, when you think about that, that that's, that's a ton of, of new people coming that we'll have to feed in addition to feeding better the ones that are there. If we have the tools, we know where we want to go, but we need the, the collective uh, decision to press forward faster. That's what we need to do. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me this week on African Podcast TV. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, you thank for you. having for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for joining me this weekend on Africa TV. Make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, so you will never miss a show again. Thank you.